Hello and welcome back to the 17th annual digital conference. Now we're going to take a look at the second thread of the day, which is on connectivity and devices. The first major intervention to tackle digital poverty is to provide those people who do not have them affordable or free connectivity and affordable or free devices. In this session, we'll hear from both initiatives funded and run by the private sector and industry and those that are funded by public sector and nonprofit organisations. Now, this next speaker is someone I've had a huge privilege of learning from, and she gave me an amazing opportunity five years ago when she invited me to work with her on IDEA. Professor Carenza Jennings has just under 30 years experience in TMT. Carenza is an award-winning digital strategist who designs high impact strategies to deliver outstanding products, services and content. She has held senior leadership positions in the public, private and charitable sectors and has been selected by Computer Weekly among the most influential tech leaders in the UK. She is also a best-selling author, professional storyteller and my old boss, former CEO of IDEA. Her current role as BT Group Director of Data Platforms leverages data and AI to help make people's lives better. As well as being a trustee at the Centre for the Acceleration of Social Technology, she's a trustee at Sir John Soames Museum and Chair of Tech UK's Local Digital Capital Working Group. Carenza, welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Polly. It's such a pleasure to be here. And just lovely to be introduced by you. I'm so proud of you and everything you've achieved. And it was just wonderful working with you. And it's just amazing seeing what you've gone on to do. So thank you. So now, imagine a world where the internet is closed down, a cyber holiday across the globe, an online blackout. Think of the chaos that would ensue. It would be like squid game dominoes crashing down as ordinary life for many would come to a halt. Banking and e-commerce would stutter to a stop. Supply chain misery on a scale unimaginable, even in today's post-pandemic context. Food would start to run out. People wouldn't be able to communicate using channels they'd grown used to. Social networks would be down. Hospitals and health services and all the patients they care for would suffer. People everywhere would be disconnected from one another. Hunger, anger, and devastation would be unleashed on the world. And I cut back to today and imagine a typical Tuesday, your, your typical Tuesday, just an ordinary midweek day when you're going about what you normally do. Only for the sake of the game, you're not allowed to use your phone for the whole 24 hours. You'd have to figure out how to get from A to B by asking others, consulting a map. Not so awful, huh? But then what if you needed to check your bank account or order something online and you're nowhere near your laptop? Oh wait, I'm taking away your laptop too. And you're not allowed to cheat and use someone else's. You're not allowed to go online. Let me ask you something. How often throughout the day do you refer to your phone for information, the time, directions, the news? How many apps do you use to organize your life? Pick up some shopping, order food or research something? Watch something, listen to something, do something. What's your screen time like? Over the last couple of decades, more and more of us have grown reliant on the internet. It sort of happened by stealth, didn't it? One moment you're recording VHS. Then next you're juggling devices as you multitask everything you do from watching TV to cooking, to entertaining the kids, to traveling and working. I lived in Japan in the early 90s, in a very remote part of the country and up a mountain in a little village before most of us had mobile phones and before people had adopted personal computers en masse, either for their home lives or their working lives. The internet was buzzing into life, but most of us didn't send emails. I wrote little letters by hand to friends and family. I longed to receive a blue envelope from overseas to help me feel connected to my life back home. But in those days, my lack of connection mirrored that of more or less everybody else. I wasn't particularly excluded. I had the telephone, which I used from time to time, although it was pro prohibitively expensive to do so very often. I got a paycheck and I could afford my bills. I was navigating a foreign country in a language I didn't know how to speak or read. 
but it was okay. I was okay. Fast forward to today, and there are people in our country who are more cut off now than I was back then. Because fast forward to today, and most of life is made possible through online connections, it has offered untold benefits to so many. Who among us could conceive how we could have got through the last devastating period of our lives without the wonders of the World Wide Web? It's helped us through the best of times and the worst of times. But think of those of us who don't have connectivity or devices, or the confidence to do things online or use the tech. How do we, they, go about their day-to-day -day lives? Many UK citizens have mobile telephones, but lots of us don't have broadband at home. And many of us choose to only have a landline. Maybe we're a bit older and feel we're perfectly fine without the internet. We've done perfectly well before and we're okay. Maybe we're a bit older and would love to understand more how to use the computers or smartphones our well-meaning families buy for us or help us install. Maybe we have access issues that challenge us or maybe we have to choose between putting food on the table or home access to the online world. I feel fortunate and proud to work for a company that is trying to help some solve some of these issues, to help make digital for everyone, from a social tariff designed to help people on benefits called BT Home Essentials, to a package of measures of support for children's access to education, to an amazing array of free training to help anyone and everyone make the most of life in the digital world, in their home or their work lives. And that's not even mentioning the wide range of support we've been giving people in need over the last few years. Everything from joining forces as a partner of the National Emergencies Trust, to funding devices for vulnerable people, to donating baby alarms to use in hospitals, to giving free data to NHS staff, and setting up the Nightingale Hospitals in a matter of days. At BT, we connect for good. We help people do what they need to do in their home life and their work life. And because connectivity powers ideas, coalitions, progress and the planet, we're continually innovating and doing our best to enrich lives across the UK and beyond. BT is a company that originally started life in 1846 as the world's first public telegraph company. It went on to develop a nationwide communications network. All these years later, we're one of the most trusted communications companies connecting families, communities and businesses all around the world. You have to admit, it's fairly unusual in an era of Google, Netflix and Facebook to think of a tech company that's been going strong for almost 200 years. But BT has been really good at evolving and adapting it's been really good at understanding its core purpose, making connections. The tech might change, but the core need for connection doesn't. What BT has done over time is reinvent itself to embrace evolving technologies. In my current job, as, as Polly was saying, I'm director of data platforms, leveraging the power of data and AI to help make people's lives better. I also chair UK's, Tech UK's local digital capital group, seeking to help unleash the potential of digital for business and for society. To take a step back, three basic ingredients drive economic growth. It's productivity, capital and labour. All three are facing new challenges as the world evolves and the key driver of change has been technology spearheaded by digital transformation. Just think of some of the tech you rely on today. Smartphones, Google, social networks like Facebook, Twitter and Instagram flash drives, cloud storage, Bluetooth, internet, internet of things, 5G and fiber. It's been clear for a number of years that those who lack the connectivity, devices and skills to navigate our digital world will either fall behind, fail to reach their potential or fall victim to online harms. As banks become more digitized, people will soon not be able to distribute money to their loved ones unless they have foundational skills. And I'm sure Benjamin on the panel next will tell you a lot more about that. Lloyd's run an incredible digital skills index each year and a program of socially focused support. Tomorrow's great business ideas simply will not blossom unless their architects can establish an online footprint. And smartphone gazing children 
risk encountering a raft of dangerous content and individuals. Technological development is fantastic when it opens doors and creates new opportunities, but we need to ensure it opens doors for everyone. We cannot allow it to only focus on a minority of users. As technology advances, using exciting innovations in AI and the opportunities of Web 3.0 and beyond, and we improve technology at our disposal, improving access to make it truly inclusive is mission critical. With no clear guidance, technology can seem more like a barrier than a connector. If there's no one to help show how to use new devices or applications. That's why the airport analogy that Matt talked about earlier is so powerful. Older people or those with reduced mobility might find touch screens fiddly to use. Visually impaired people might struggle with small fonts, unhelpful color contrasts on screen and buttons which are hard to find. And the range of options on devices, products and services can be perplexing for everyone, particularly those with access needs. But as you know, it's not just people who find themselves left behind in their twilight years. It can be people who work with you and me, who struggle with ever-changing software and hardware, worry about not being able to help their children or succeed at work. Our Skills for Tomorrow programme, set up towards the end of 2019 and led by me and my team, invests in helping people with confidence and skills to make the most of life in the digital world. We aim to help 25 million people by 2026 and have already made good progress, helping more than 10 million so far. But it's not just us. All the panelists coming up have amazing initiatives, but they will tell you all about them. We want to help drive systemic change, a movement, a movement for progress. Big business needs to step up to tackle the digital divide, and we will make more impact if we do it together. This is why I'm personally deeply committed to lending my support and championship to the Digital Poverty Alliance, who is sponsoring our conference today. We have a bold ambition to help end digital poverty. I was honored to have been invited to join as an ambassador in a personal capacity and want to try to do my bit. This starts, I think, by helping shine a light on some of the programs I am involved with, which help address social mobility and digital exclusion which of course are inextricably linked. I'd like anyone watching this to keep a note of some of these organizations in case they could help people you know in your network someday. First, a big shout out here to CAST and Catalyst, where I'm a trustee. They're helping civil society grow digital capability and capacity through digital data and design, ultimately benefiting millions of people across England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland and beyond. If you know a charity that could do with some help, please point them over here. I also want to call out the work of Future.Now. I was delighted until recently to serve on their board. Alongside their chair, Sir Peter Estlin, CEO Liz Williams, and other great organisations like Lloyd's, Salesforce, PwC, Nominate and Good Things Foundation having been part of the original working group that helped create it. For those who don't know, Future.Now aims to help workforces across the UK understand the benefits of digital skills, not just for productivity in the bottom line, which is also critical, but for the well-being and prospects of people who work. I'm keen to signpost the brilliant work both Fast Futures and Movement to Work do to help people from underrepresented backgrounds make that vital bridge into education, from education into work in the digital economy. Movement to Work focuses on young people not in education, employment or training. Fast Futures has created a completely free virtual programme with free wraparound support to help cohorts of young people learn digital and employability skills using business case studies from employers such as BT, Barclays and the NHS. Both Fast Futures and Movement to Work are helping transform young lives in our country. There are so many other organisations I want to tell you about. I urge you to Google Teen Tech, Every Child Needs a Mentor, and the Magnificent Positive Transformation Group. Nominet are doing amazing things in this space, including a work working alongside Salesforce in the early days to fund IDEA. 
I started my talk today by asking you to imagine a world where the internet closed down for a while and then a 24 hour period where you in your life wouldn't be able to go online. The first scenario borders on apocalypse. The second, if it happened, would make many of us twitchy and anxious. A whole ordinary day without being able to access the internet. Just think about it. Well, the brutal reality is that many citizens across all of our devolved nations don't or can't access the internet. Deprived of the information superhighway, which enables so many of us to lead enriched, enabled, empowered lives. The Digital Poverty Alliance wants to help fix this, to help create a more equitable digital economy for all. Digital really can be for everyone, but we have to work together to make it happen. So with that, back to you, Polly, and thank you everyone for your time this morning. Thank you so much, Carenza. Um, that was just a really, really, really interesting chat and, and a great story that really highlights the need, I think, for every household to have connectivity and devices and how important it is for everyone to have the skills and, and the confidence to do the things that we need to do online. And thank you also for sharing with us some of the brilliant initiatives um, and the good that BT is doing. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have a panel discussion on the role of business and this panel will be chaired by Lee Smith. Um, and Lee is, sorry, I'm just having a minor technical difficulty. Lee is an award-winning social inclusion consultant with a background in enabling all organisations to do well by also doing good. This includes launching the UK's first children's range of technology at PCW, le leading to design the market model for the government home access £350 million programme for low income families. Lee also worked with Baroness Lane Fox as the CEO to lead the Race Online 2012 campaign and to establish the Go On UK charity to tackle the UK's digital inclusion agenda. More recently, as the first Responsible Transformation Director in the UK whilst at Lloyds Banking Group, Lee led the team across multiple national initiatives, including design and delivery of the Lloyds Banking Digital Skills Academy for everyone, which has gone on to now train hundreds of thousands of people per year. And Lee has since established a global social inclusion strategy consultancy and advised the money and pension service on mobilising a financial well-being movement and the international and international companies plus initiatives such as the United Nations, where her work has led onto a universal financial inclusion commitment for the global banking sector. Lee is currently designing the strategy and delivery plans for Tech for Good startups, and Lee is also a board member of the Tech Talent Charter and is the chair of the Digital Poverty Alliance Community Board. Welcome, Lee. Please um, introduce your panel. Oh, thank you, Polly. Um, so I'm a massive believer. I'm so delighted to be able to host this panel. And like Carenza was just saying, I'm a huge believer in big business being able to have such a big impact in this agenda. And I'm lucky enough in that I've worked for charities where you've got lots of passion, but not the resources. Um, working in government where you've got lots of resources, but it can be quite slow because of, um, you know, long, lengthy governance uh, processes and changes in policy and politics. And then big, big in, and then also in big business where you can leverage all the resources and you can move quicker and you and you also have got lots of passion from the people in those organisations. So I'm really delighted that um, Robin, thank you, asked me to host this panel and apologies for my voice, I'm just recovering from an illness. But um, yeah, so on our panel today, we have three brilliant people. We've got Ben Welland, who's the MD and Head of Healthcare and TMT at Lloyds Banking Group. And Ben heads up the healthcare um, and TMT uh, division with um, corporate and institutional coverage at LBG and joined in 2019. Uh, just as I was leaving, so I didn't get to meet him. Um, but he's got overall responsibility for all client relationships across 
the two sectors and not just in the UK but globally so we're really lucky to have Benjamin um, along with us today so thank you Ben for joining us and um, we've also got fantastic Nikki um, Lions from Vodafone who are doing so much in this space her and her team are just awesome um, and Nikki became director of corporate affairs and sustainability in 2021 um, and you'll have noticed quite a lot of activity from Vodafone in this space during that time. Um, and she's got responsibility for all external communications, government affairs, regulatory affairs, and also sustainable business. So quite a big brief there, Nikki. Um, and Nikki's held her previous senior roles at Boots, um, which I worked at a long, long time ago, but there's an awesome company in Nottingham, Unilever and PepsiCo and also in UK government and international development. So a bit like myself is able to kind of see the difference in the pros and cons working between the different sectors. And also um, Nikki specializes in corporate reputation management and ESG, which is uh, growing in um, a function within most organizations, most good ones anyway. Uh, so thank you, Nikki, for joining us and uh, spending time with us today. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, and then also Tim, who I met, was it for the first time last year, Tim, um, when we were working on a project for the Digital Poverty Alliance, but um, Tim's, Tim's fantastic and uh, a real one of these people that you meet in an organisation that can make change happen in even global organisations such as Intel. Um, and Tim joined in 2000 and you've got 22 years of digital transformation from the Intelligent Edge or IoT to client and cloud transformations um, in a wide variety of industry verticals, which must be language that you use in Intel. Um, Tim now works in support of the UK public sector activities within UK government and has a core focus on CSR or in our world corporate social responsibility, um, such as the fantastic RISE technology initiative, which I'm very familiar with, um, which addresses the digital issues divide issues um, in collaboration with the Digital Poverty Alliance, which uh, with my other hat on, I am chair of. So absolutely delighted to have the three of you with us today on this panel. Um, I'd really like to um, just spend the first two moments, if I may, by asking you all to kind of introduce yourselves, I guess, rather than in my words, um, and also why you think this agenda is so important to your organization because everybody that's on the call today might not know your particular interest in um, this issue that we're debating today. So if I may ask you all to kind of give your five minutes, if that's OK, starting with Ben, I think, if that's all right. Of course. Thanks very much, Lee. And I should start by saying that I'm, uh, for my sins, not a digital inclusion specialist. But the reason I'm on this panel, I think, shows the relevance that digital inclusion has to the wider dialogue that we have when interacting with with clients of the bank and the, the way i really think about um, digital inclusion connectivity and devices is that there's really three things that need to be true for people to be able to access everything that is available uh, online and really have uh, the, the richest access to uh, the internet and, and all the services that come with it. So first of all, there needs to be strong broadband connectivity. And we know in a lot of parts of the country, it can still be very, very slow speeds that people get access to. It is changing rapidly. And Lloyd's is the largest infrastructure bank in the UK. We're very, very heavily involved in funding the rollout of fiber to the home to ensure that people can actually get super fast ultra fast speeds wherever they are and be that in rural locations be that uh, in, in the middle of cities it really varies still right you can be in the center of london and still have very poor connectivity if you haven't had a recent uh, sort of fiber provider come and, and provide that last cabling into your home so that is one part uh, where lloyd's is playing a big role we're, we're funding this rollout and people may have seen the recent City Fiber announcement where they raised uh, over four billion pounds of debt to fund uh, rollout of fiber to the home to over eight million uh, homes ultimately. So uh, very much aligned with the government strategy of getting to 85% of population coverage for these gigabit capable speeds. 
So that's one part. And the second part is people actually need to have devices to access uh, these fast speeds. And what Lloyd's does in that regard, we have a, a digital helpline, which uh, not only does it provide training on free basic digital skills, this is something we're doing in conjunction with uh, We Are Digital. And that training that is being provided uh, really enables our clients and, and anyone else who calls that the, the helpline to get a much better understanding of how to access all these services. Now, the great thing about it is if, and this can be done on the call, uh, it becomes apparent that uh, the individuals don't have access to data or devices, the helpline actually has the power to uh, provide those services and devices to the individual. Something, for example, that we're doing in conjunction with Vodafone, where Vodafone provides six months of free data and, and we might be providing the device. So an indication of uh, something that Lloyd's is doing very actively at the moment. And that brings me to the third point, which is really giving people access to the skills and to have the confidence to access uh, everything that's out there. Uh, the Lloyds Bank Academies were referenced earlier. As uh, Karenza said, we've, had, we've trained hundreds of thousands of people already. That is expanding to small businesses as well. So it is, is very much the focus of, of ensuring we go as broadly as possible so that people have access to that skill set. And the other sort of part I just wanted to mention was on essential digital skills. So the government had uh, asked Lloyds to really drive forward uh, that dialogue and we publish uh, a yearly index in this regard, really trying to take stock of what essential digital skills are required and what percentage of individuals actually have those skills. And it's very interesting to see the, the regional disparities there, how it's changing over time, uh, what mechanisms and initiatives might work. Future.now, again, we're very heavily involved in that, and uh, that, that makes a big difference in this regard. It's Once you take those three things together, where you really have the enabler to ensure that every can, everyone can access um, digital services on a global basis. So I'll probably leave it there from a Lloyd's perspective for now, but look forward to the Q&A later on. Thanks, Ben. And um, I think LBG is, I'm going to be biased here, obviously, but, um, you know, it's a really good example of leveraging assets other than just funds. So being able to access their data because they use a million consumer records in the provision of the indexes, uh, using people, which is their digital academy and all the technology um, that they have as an organisation, but also their space to be able to run the academy in face to face locations and stuff when we're outside of COVID. So I think it's a great example of how an organisation can leverage its resources to be able to help this agenda. Um, and Ben, thanks so much for that. And um, I had realised quite how big you were in the provision of the actual connectivity and all of all of that as a, as a bank in your day job. So um, thank you so much for your contribution. Um, uh, if we could go over to Nikki now, if that's OK. Hi. Hi, Lee. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you uh, for having me here this morning. I'm really excited to talk about about what Vodafone is doing um, to uh, to support um, organisations and and um, and consumers and and try and close the digital divide. I mean, it's a it's a big challenge. It's certainly not one that we're going to um, manage to do all by ourselves. I th I think one of one of the things that um, always strikes me about these conversations is is the the sheer scale of the problem. So you know, Carenza talked quite extensively about imagine if you didn't have access to the internet or if your mobile phone didn't work for, for the day and any of us that had the experience of you know those first few weeks of working from home in the pandemic I'm sure had a, had a version of that reality um, so I'm really proud of, of everything that Vodafone is doing in, in the way that we live our purpose to support um, the need for better connectivity 
across the digital divide in the UK. Um, so a little bit about, about what we do and how we do it. We, we developed a, a program during the pandemic called everyone.connected. And this has become our guiding principle or our, our umbrella um, for everything um, that we, we are hoping to do to support those on the wrong side of the, of the digital divide. Um, Everyone Connected encompasses a number of, of programs with a number of partners. Um, so we work um, really closely with Bernardo's, with the Trussell Trust, with We Are Digital, with Good Things Foundation. Um, and through the, the, the different programs, we are providing connectivity. So as, as Ben mentioned, we're working closely with Lloyd's um, and the Lloyd's Helpline and a, a, um, a program in branch to identify people who, who just don't have access to connectivity. Um, and then we, we provide that SIM for six months for free. Um, the, the, the broader program um, is about um, what else do you need? If you have that connectivity for six months, um, you also need a device. Um, and we're working with with a number of partners. We did a, a great appeal actually at Christmas um, last year, um, which we called the Great British Tech Appeal, uh, where we invited our customers, those lucky enough to be getting a new device at, at Christmas, um, to recycle their device um, in our stores. We cleaned them up. Um, we removed all the all incriminating data and then we pass them on to to people who, who don't have access to the latest iPhone and who need a device to to um, run their daily lives. Um, and then uh, the other piece of the puzzle is is you know, how we've been able to, to pivot the campaign um, to help people in need when when problems arise so we were able to mobilize quite quickly um, to support ukrainian refugees coming into the uk partnership um, with various refugee organizations that enabled us to give both devices and connectivity um, and then free calls back to ukraine um, for, for ref newly arriving refugees um, and, and it's through actually a, a side aspect of, of everyone connected is, is charities connected. And this is, is the part my, my team will know that this is the, the bit that, that is so close to my heart because what we're doing, we, we've got 1,500 charities on board. Um, overall, we've, we've reached 350,000 people. We've got a million um, target to reach at the end of the year. And the charities connected part of the, the campaign is is working with really small charities, um, inviting them to contact us to sign up to be part of of Everyone Connected to receive SIMs, so that they can work really locally um, to help people in need with um, with connectivity. And that movement, that group of fifteen hundred charities is educating us on the need and the 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 scope of the divide and and helping us um understand what we need to do next so we're already in conversations about you know what happens how do we reach the next million um and what do what do uh, those on the wrong side of the divide need? Is it connectivity? Is it devices? Is it actually skills and education? Um, you know, if you're a if you're, and I think Karenza mentioned this, you're a, an elderly person, you've been given a, a device and connectivity by a, a well-meaning family member. Um, but when you come to park your car, you you suddenly realize you, your city center has turned <laughs> fully mobile. Um, you don't have the app, you don't have the um, the ability, you can't see on your phone properly to, to be able to um, sign up for parking and, and pay for parking in the city centre and the the implications of that might mean that you go back home and you don't try you don't try it again um, so how can we how can we support um, that next stage which is if we've provided connectivity we've provided a device are there their skills are there are there ways of designing apps that we need to be thinking about um, that can can truly help people and make this a fully rounded program to get everyone connected. Thank you, Nikki. And I think um, 
there's a certain thread coming through from what you and Ben were saying and also from the earlier conversations today on uh, on the 17th event, which is amazing, which is around right time and right place and actually more holistic. So you've talked about the kind of the skills, the connectivity and the device itself. And actually, you know, the definition of digital poverty is bringing a solution to people as and when they need it. So it's making sure that people have got the ability to use that device at the point of need, that they've got the connect connectivity when they need it. And, and by working together, and you were just saying earlier that you're work already working with Lloyds, and I know you're working with We Are Digital as well, to be able to bring that solution at point of need, I think is, is, is where that change in the way we think is much needed. And that's a, another theme from today in terms of just completely stopping and rethinking how we fix this so thank you for that and um just con massive congratulations to you as vodafone in the last you know 12 to 8 just in the digital inclusion space for like um, maybe 15 20 years now and uh, vodafone are all over it so well done to you and the team you've got a great team there and it, i know it's not easy thank you and to have that amount of impact in a short, short amount of time is awesome um and then um so thank you for that nikki and uh over to tim so tim with intel you supply how many chips in a year um millions but what a lot of uh, people might not realize is all the kind of thought leadership and the actual seed funding that you put into different initiatives on a global scale uh, including digital inclusion um to really move that dial um and in my experience intel are not overly kind of the they don't have the time but you do great stuff so i'm delighted that you're here today to show and, and, and open the lid a little bit on how your organization helps this agenda and what things you guys have been up to so if you don't mind um spending the next five minutes just explaining to the audience what it is that intel does and and your role specifically that would be really good thank you no, of course, of course, happy to do that, and and thank you again to the to the organisation here for the opportunity to come and come and join you. I mean, it's a great collective group of people and and minds looking at a very important topic in in society. So, just still, good morning. We're nearly into the afternoon. Um, as you mentioned, Lee, uh, people don't often consider uh, Intel in this way as being kind of customer facing. We are uh, largely an ingredient brand uh, in many other people's solutions that then are consumed. Um, hopefully. Um, out in the market and we've got a, a, obviously some huge pressing challenges in the industry um, and some other things you know to, things opportunities for us to collectively look at what we can do to make a difference but just to set the scene uh, from an intel point of view and lee you've already picked me up on my on my corporate speak so i'll try and apologize in advance for any of that that comes through um, but we set out some very ambitious goals in the kind of 2020, May 2020 uh, timeframe for what we need to do as a corporate business uh, during this decade, um, which, and I'm sure this will resonate uh, with Nikki and Benjamin on the rest on the, on the uh, panel today, that um, we have acronyms for everything at Intel, um, but we have an initiative called RISE, um, which sets out a set of our commitments towards a sort of more responsible, inclusive and sustainable world um, enabled through technology and enabled through the passion of the employees really um, and Lee's mentioned that she's had a very positive experience of working with us so far um, but it's something we're looking to do increasingly uh, as we go forward and so just what do I mean with with rise so the responsible business side of it we need to be taking a lead in advancing systems so from a safety and um, wellness and, and responsible uh, sort of business practice perspective across our own internal operations but also what we enable for our uh, partners and, and fellow travelers if you like in terms of what they do to get products and services out, out to the market and make sure that that's happening in a, in a responsible way it's something we focus on very uh, very hard and um, also from the eye of the rise that the talks to the inclusion we're very proud of sort of the advanced diversity and inclusion across our workforce um, and the expanding opportunities for citizens in the, in the UK through kind of technology inclusion activities and digital readiness initiatives. And I'll come on to give you an example of how 
Um, we've crossed paths with this uh, and, and obviously Lee here specifically. Uh, but then in the background, we want to be a leader in sustainability, enable our customers and, and others to reduce their environmental impact through what we do with technology. Te demand for technology has never been higher. Um, I think we've all witnessed this digital transformation is reshaping every aspect of society. Certainly over the last two years, the, the COVID pandemic has shown us lots of examples of how technology can help solve some of the world's most pressing challenges. But it, it is about doing that in a sustainable, inclusive and, and responsible way. Um, but yeah, our, our continued sort of commitment to, to that is embedded in, in what we try to do. Um, work through partners really to deliver the greatest impact in that way um, and try and find those innovative answers to some of these things like digital poverty, um, the digital divide. Um, I think it's an incredibly, incredibly important topic that we're here to discuss today. So just to give you an example, as Lee inferred earlier on, um, we do try to uh, bring funding to bear to enable uh, outcomes um, to address some of these these large issues. A couple that we've been working on recently with the Digital Poverty Alliance look at um, digital divide for teachers. Um, huge amount of respect for what they've been through trying to deliver home learning uh, over this whole pandemic period, but it really has highlighted some quite serious gaps in the provision of the technology to enable those teachers to do that in the right way. Uh, and obviously, from a mobile phone perspective to connect those devices once they have them in in their hands um but uh, you know a, a, a significant project has looked at the digital divide from a teacher's perspective a another looks at the impact of technology for young offenders so we've seen that access to quality devices is a key part of enabling people to access the digital world successfully and there were examples given about going into cities and being able to, to, to access all of those digital services today. Um, there is evidence of the impact of technology provided within a prison to enable with new skills, but there's been little evidence of the impact of technology for those young offenders upon leaving a prison. Um, and we believe uh, that the provision of technology to improve those life chances of individuals and reduce the financial burden on the state uh, of the, the risk of reoffending. Uh, because of the situation they find themselves in um, is an important one. Uh, and we've been working with the Digital Poverty Alliance to enable some funding, enable some recycled, I might add, devices out into the industry to try and help create white papers and case studies to uh, demonstrate that the provision of technology and the evaluation of that um, proof of concept could be used to sort of evidence-based, a, a digital intervention to scale that proof of concept and reach more people in, in that way. Um, so just in summary, I think it's, uh, you know, we are working through partners. Uh, we're excited about the opportunities that hopefully make a difference in society. Uh, and we have the ambition to try and bring, you know, certainly Intel's uh, capabilities to bear and try and deliver value in, in that way. But hopefully that helps to maybe articulate why, why Intel are here as well. Uh, we're not quite often considered as, as somebody in these sorts of forums, but. Mm, that's great. Um, that and you all, you all three are like leading examples of what big business can do in this space. So I'm going to get a bit more provocative now, I, I suppose, in my questions, because uh, you three are leading examples and, and ask you with your experience, because you've each had to present business cases to your organisations to get them to get behind this. Um, it's not as easy as you're just coming up with an idea and being able to go and then deliver it. But with that context and your experience and, the, you know, hundreds of stakeholders you meet in this agenda all the time, what do you think are the kind of the three key things that we need to do that aren't being addressed right now that we need to do? Because the numbers are still big. The digital poverty is there. It's It's enormous and it's much needed to be fixed in especially in you know as people walk out of the pandemic out into the cost of living crisis if not now then in october you know what when the bills go up again um you know what are we what you know between the three of you what are the three things that need to happen 
in order for this to be addressed so that we're not here this time next year talking about the same issue, but we're talking about something else and continually improving the agenda. Um, perhaps, Nikki, if I can go to you first, if that's OK, to ask you what kind of big yeah. three things you think we need to fix. Um, yeah, no, it's a really good question. I, I think for me, and you're right to mention cost of living, because that is the that is the burning platform. And if we can't get this right now, then we we will be in, in much, much bigger trouble, I think, as a country. Um, so for me, it's about um, the role of, of government as a coordinating body, um, as well as the government as an investor in this space. So obviously, I think I think everybody would agree that the government needs to tackle this challenge with with investment, whether that's investment for infrastructure and, and Ben mentioned, you know, private sector investment in in building infrastructure. But there, there's, of course, there's a role for government to play there as well. Um, and one that our government has referenced numerous occasions and not quite delivered on. Um, I think the the government role as a coordinating body is also crucial. We had we had a really interesting um, sponsored uh, round table at the House of Commons a couple of weeks ago uh, with um, some parliamentarians and some um, uh, organisations that are are seeing the need and not and not understanding why you know when they hear from companies or they hear from 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 big charities that action is happening and and they're not seeing it themselves government could could play a really vital role in pulling the the groups that that are already doing things together coordinating an approach that is meaningful, that touches the whole country. So it's not just you know, Andy Burnham in Manchester talking to us about what can you do for my people, but it's a it's a holistic approach. And then you would involve um, the, uh, the local housing authority, you would involve the um, local education authority, the schools themselves, you would bring in the NHS trust, and you would build series of, of local solutions and replicate it across the country. And that's something that, that I think we're all trying to do, um, but a coordinating force would just would just make it so much more impactful. Um, and then the last is the is is the thing I, I mentioned uh, touched on a little bit earlier. Um, it's the skills. It's it's not assuming that um, everybody and and whether it's socioeconomic, whether it's age related, um, it it doesn't really matter. The assumption that every kid can use an iPad is a is a horrible middle class assumption it doesn't it doesn't um it doesn't mean that every child in the country has access to an ipad and and the first time they're handed it whether it's you know you now need to go into your online classroom and use this ipad to to learn a lesson it doesn't mean they know how to do with it and and know what to do with it and if they if they do are they using it safely are they using it responsibly are they um getting the most from from the the technology that's available can they navigate to the right apps that can give them um educate the right kind of educational support or are they in a in a horrible chat room being targeted by by somebody who who whose intention isn't pure so the, there's the, we we talk about connectivity and the idea of, of connecting a person as the solution it's just the beginning of the solution. And underneath it, there are layers and layers of, of um, support that's required to make sure people get the most out of, out of being online and, and, and do it in a, in a, self, in a self, safe and healthy way. Yeah, and I think that um, there's some chat as well, Nikki, in the um, chat about government and echoing the kind of the, the digital strategy last week. I don't know if anybody saw Emma's Weston's uh, blog on uh, LinkedIn um, about it uh, being quite strong and lo getting lots of support, like over 100 people supporting her comments that it's just not enough. And Mark suggests in the yeah. chat that some sort of um, wh where, where perhaps companies can support is by lobbying together um, on the actual uh, what government needs to do in this respect. The other thing I would mention, actually, 
um, that you inspired me by just talking about government was the fact that they do 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 stuff as well, but they don't talk about it. So they run several assisted digital programs and they do not talk about it at all with significant investment. So, you know, there's there's a there's a real opportunity, I think, for government to work hand in hand with with corporates and trying to join it all up. They're a bit like a huge Lloyd's, I suppose, Ben, in, in that they've got not just, I don't know how many divisions Lloyd's have got now, but maybe 20 have you got? <laughs> they've got probably. <laughs> they've all got 10 times that amount, so it's not an easy job to do. But I think by working together in best practice of what how government um, and private sector do join the dots, I think is, is critical. Um, thank you, Nikki, for that. Um, over to you, Ben, with the same question on the kind of what are the three things that we need to fix? Taking your Lloyd's hat off for a minute, what would, if you were the Prime Minister, what would you do? <laughs> yeah, and look, I, I, I would certainly echo a lot of what Nikki has said. Um, just sort of from the ground up, I mean, we know from our data that uh, about 15 million people in the UK have got low digital capability and 10 million of those lack digital access altogether so the, the big question from my perspective is and it's, it's sort of picking up Lee, what, what you just said um in terms of the government not talking enough about what they're doing is a how do you identify those individuals and then once you've identified them how do you nudge them towards a lot of the support and fantastic support that is out there and data can clearly play a big role in that i mean we as an organization have uh, reams and reams of data uh, that we're trying to use and, and make available uh, via, for example, the Essential Digital Skills Index, uh, so that people can target this support a bit better. So that would be one of my big asks, um, just finding the people and then really nudging them, I would say, towards some of the support schemes. And then the third point uh, would be around cost of access as well. Um, ET, who were on earlier, uh, for example, provide a social tariff uh, for their broadband to anyone uh, sort of receiving benefits. And again, it's something that people need to be made aware of uh, and to then access. But the fact that that type of tariff exists, I think, is fantastic and certainly plays a uh, is a big component in how a company like BT talks about its uh, environment, environmental, social and governance uh, sort of objectives because from a social perspective, giving people access to uh, affordable broadband is clearly a, a very, very important point. Yeah, thank you. I think that's um, a really valid point about the tariffs and um, encouraging others to offer the same, if not better, deals and then advertising those deals as well and um, for the people that need them the most i think that's more than well it'd be needed more than ever before particularly as i was looking at some numbers recently that talked about the new shift of people moving into that bracket as well um where they've traditionally not needed that type of help um but ever so more so as we head into the winter so thank you so much for mentioning that because i think that uh, point around access um, to information also includes access to deals um, and uh, Pepe just said not only BT but many broadband providers offer those type of tariffs as well so and I know there are tariffs not just in connectivity but in water and in all sorts of other utilities as well so really important that people are aware of those. Um, thank you Ben um, and over to you Tim to ask the same question so taking your um, intel hat off for a minute which might be difficult after 22 years <laughs> you probably are intel um you know what what three things do you think that we need to do as a, as a uk to fix this so that we can start and some maybe some no regrets activity between now and the autumn so that we can really start to shift the dial on this yeah i mean I I'm going to have to say that, it, that a lot of what Nikki and Benjamin have, have covered already really resonates with my own personal uh, view of the world. I think I think that two that spring straight to mind, there is a, a divide in terms of the skills gap to enable, um, you know, the making making sure that we are able to address uh, these issues. So I think skills would be one. Um, I think the the policy around security 
uh, so that the uh, devices and, and the connectivity are able to be used in a way uh, that, that creates um, closure of that digital divide, if that makes sense. I think there's some, uh, there's some investment that would be good to be seen in that way. Um, but I think if I, and this isn't really with just a, a, an Intel hat on, uh, although you will see the influence, but I think one of the major challenges that I see is how uh, the the pace of change that's happening within the this this industry that we're talking about that, that's enabling uh, a lot of these these capabilities. Most leaders of organisations find themselves these days behind the curve of understanding the art of the possible. Um, so I think one of the big things is is how can we look at addressing uh, making sure that we're, we're keeping agile and up to to pace on on what could be done, um, yeah. uh, because I think there's a huge opportunity in in working with big business and uh, joining the dots between lots of very capable organisations to deliver uh, things that really will make a difference. Um, but the pace of change is is unbelievable in the background. It's only been exacerbated by the whole COVID situation. I'm not sure if if the others have a view on that as well. Um, and you, that raises a very good point. I think digital inclusion is one of the few things that there's not a what work centre for. So somewhere that government invests in to have continual insight, refreshed, updated pilots, et cetera, to really drive the change. So that could be leading on to my next question, actually, if I didn't mind introducing it myself, was um, around policy change. I don't know if any of you have got any ideas on what you think the number one policy change could be to change this agenda. Um, and uh, something that you believe in. Uh, who would like to answer? I, that I think for, I, I can jump in if you like, Lee. I think for me, it's about the disparate nature of government funding, and it's you know it's certainly not not unique to this problem. Um, but you know, we back to the reference earlier about the um, the digital strategy, government's digital strategy. Um, has been implemented by giving funding, you know, a certain amount of funding to the NHS to, for them to look at digital, a certain amount of funding to the Department of Education. Then you've got, you know, social welfare, all, all different departments thinking about their own solution. And I think the, the most valuable policy change would be to say this is the biggest problem this country is facing in the future. National infrastructure, the pandemic brought all of this to the surface. And, and now we need a, a connected, coordinated, funded body to lead the change um, across all of those different sectors and across all of those different government departments. And when, when we think about a solution, I mean, we also, we're also um, heavily working in the, the, what we call the convergent space. So where, where um, people want to have their broadband and their mobile and all their children's mobile devices, everything connected to each other. And again, there's, there's an opportunity to via relatively simple policy and then, and then policy coordination and then funding to, to say is this is not just a broadband issue. This is not just a mobile issue. This is not just about kids accessing online um, for school or a uh, person accessing their GP services um, via a, um, an app to book an appointment or the man I mentioned earlier who, who wants to park his car in the city center, um, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is moving online and, and government policy needs to address every aspect of our lives um, that that is connected or or to the point of, of those that, that aren't connected if you're not connected in one part of your life you're also not connected in any other part of your life can i jump in as well just in the interest of time i think there's a global nature to this discussion i think it's i think it's very important that we're talking about issues in the uk and i and, mm. and i agree completely with nikki talking about the stovepipe nature of the different government departments and how budgets don't necessarily flow across those. But if we if we look at that in a bigger picture context, um, there's a huge amount of uh, global um, impact and potential for global impact to meet some of those requirements that would reach across all of our local issues. 
without having to do them in lots of different local individual places. So I think there's there needs to be, uh, and I don't have the solution for it, but 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 the, there is a huge opportunity in finding ways to deliver local value from global kind of scale, whether it's device connectivity, um, industry. But just to add that, I think it's um, yeah, the global global piece is is hugely important for me. Yeah, and I think um, Tim. Um... It, uh, uh, and by defence perspective, it'd be great to understand what your organisations are doing outside the UK as well to be able to share on this agenda. And there's been some really good comments in the chat. Um, I know that Robin will be calling me to close down this conversation because I'm running over time, as um, as you might expect I would, with you three um, people just talking um, such common sense about what we need to do. But there's um, some really helpful stuff in the chat as well, like Sharon um, Tannen has been saying that um, I didn't realise that affordable tariffs are not available to people um, on pension credit. So extending that um, would be really helpful. So I know um, you, you Vodafone, you might take that back as well from your tariffs um, and we'll pass that on to BT. I've got a call with some uh, one of the non-execs of BT. Uh, in the morning actually so I'll, I'll speak to them and also Carenza um but yeah do have a look panel please if you may at some of the conversation in the chat as well and, and do feel free to um, answer some of the uh, questions or statements um as we move on today um I think I might have run out of time um to ask you any more questions but I could literally spend all day with you um raiding your clever heads but just to summarize if I may Polly um I think what we're saying ahead, is that, we, that uh, to Nikki's point, a holistic solution, really the, the whole problem around um, government and helping them to join it up as you have to do, I think is really key to solving this and to treat it as the number one priority is a must. Um, and I think there's a role for big business, not just on delivery, which is Matt's point from his earlier keynote, but bring so that we create you know there's lots of airplanes delivering lots of solutions we need to bring it all together and having that nudge factor that ben references um so we're going to where people are and nudging them in the right direction which then plays true to the behavioral conversation that happened earlier and again it comes through all the time but that lifelong learning approach to skills it's not a one-trip pony that nikki um was referring to and she's a big believer in making sure that we have the skills for people's lives, not just as a one-off. So thank you so much for sharing your stories, both as individuals and experts in this arena, but also from the excellent perspective of your companies, all the great stuff that they're doing uh, to help people with their lives. And if we could only get the rest of the Bigfootses together to be more like you guys, then we wouldn't be here. So uh, yes, but uh, thank you for setting the bar so high. And uh, thanks Polly and Robin for asking me to speak today and to share such a great session. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Nikki. And thank you, Tim. Yeah, thank really, you, ben. Really good to hear your perspectives. And I agree with what Lee said. I think you guys are setting a really, really good example of how organisations can leverage their resources to lend support and help close the digital divide. So now, before we break for lunch, we have another panel, and this one is on grassroots and government. And it's going to be chaired by Chris Ashworth. Chris is the head of social impact for Nominet, the guardian of the .uk namespace. Chris leads on the design and delivery of Nominet's social impact work and philanthropic, philanthropic funding, focusing on initiatives that close the digital divide and improve skills and safety for young people in the UK. Chris has been at the forefront of a number of national campaigns tackling digital poverty, from devices.now during the pandemic to the Reboot project BBC's Give a Laptop Appeal, and more recently, the Digital Youth Index and Data Poverty Lab. Chris is a member of the GLA's Digital Exclusion Task Force and Getting Oxfordshire Online, as well as the APPG on Data Poverty. Welcome, Chris. I will turn it away and, and leave it to you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I might ask for a few thumbs up emojis if you've got access to it just so I know everyone can hear me okay. Any thumbs up from anyone would be great. Oh, there we go, a couple of thumbs up, 
Great, fantastic. Well, firstly, a warm welcome to everyone here. Uh, big thanks to Polly and uh, Robin for doing such a brilliant job in hosting today. I found that last conversation really, really interesting. Um, I hope you've all made good use of the facilities in the Digital Leaders Lounge today. And if you haven't had your pre-lunch digital cocktail yet, then please do immediately message Robin. Uh, place your order and he'll start shaking and making while we do the introduction. So um, as Polly said, my name's Chris. I'm the Head of Social Impact at Nominet. Um, I won't go back through all the bio stuff. I work, I've worked in this space for a number of years and I'm a real passionate advocate for everything to do with digital exclusion and digital inequality. Um, we've got an incredible panel today and I hope that builds on some of the earlier topics and br bridges uh, you all into a, a brilliant afternoon session, um, which I'll be tuning into. So we're here to discuss the role of government and grassroots in tackling digital exclusion. At both strata of, of civil society, there's been a profound involvement for uh, both since the pandemic uh, and, and during it, sometimes together, sometimes in isolation, that came up a lot um, earlier, sometimes with slightly conflicting agendas. So I'm sure that the, the breadth of interventions that um, Dr. Kira's uh, evidence review will look at was quite an undertaking. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing that from the Digital Poverty Alliance in the next few weeks. Um, but it's a great time now to take stock and reflect on what we've observed, what we've learned, and what we might be um, in charge of engineering into the future. So I'm joined by, I think, four, possibly five, if they've made their way, incredible thought leaders in this space, who have been behind some of the most effective initiatives in, in recent years. So Emma, Eddie, Claudia, Ian and John. That means we're blessed with representatives from Connecting Scotland, the Data Poverty Lab, 100% um, Digital Leads, and London's Office for Technology and Innovation, so those combined authorities and, and, and hopefully central government. Um, I've got a little privilege of knowing and working with, with many of these, but let's get straight into the discussion. If you have any um, questions, more than happy to replace mine for anything that comes up, so please pop it in the Q&A and I'll do my best to keep my eye on things. Um, we'll begin by hearing from each of the panellists before we move on to into the discussion. So if the technology has worked, I'm not sure uh, if uh, Dr. Emma Stone has managed to enter the room. If not, then I might uh, jump around a little bit to uh, my good friend Eddie to see if you wouldn't mind um, providing us with some opening remarks. Very happy to. And yes, good to see you, Chris. Good to see the rest of uh, the panel. And uh, my name is Eddie Copeland. I am the director of an organisation called the London Office of Technology and Innovation, Lottie for short. Uh, and essentially, it's the job of my team to help London boroughs collaborate on digital and data innovation projects that improve public services and outcomes for Londoners. Uh, we joke we're professional cat herders trying to get these different organisations aligned, working together, given that everything we know about the big thorny challenges affecting a place like London, uh, given everything we know about how to use data and technology well, doing it at some scale makes a real difference. Ensuring we're sharing lessons, sharing insights, sharing approaches is really, really vitally important. Uh, so that's my world. One of the key tenets we have at Lottie is that we don't do tech and data for tech and data's sake. We do them to apply to big real world outcomes that we want to achieve for Londoners. And I guess right now, delighted we've got this whole day, uh, this whole session thinking about uh, digital inclusion, one of the most sort of influential, important issues um, of our current time. So over the last year, we've been very lucky to uh, get some additional funding from our colleagues at the Greater London Authority, uh, led um, this bit led by Theo Blackwell, London's Chief Digital Officer, to ensure that we can work with boroughs, with their VCS partners, with their private sector partners, specifically on tackling digital um, exclusion. So just a brief flavour of the kind of stuff that we've been working on. Number one, we started by doing a bit of a sort of crowdsourcing exercise, trying to figure out what is already going on across London when it comes to digital inclusion. And the great news to kick off with is that there's so much stuff happening out there. We're here to talk about government and grassroots. The grassroots are really healthy. They're doing amazing work on skills, on sort of digital mentors, on local uh, laptop and other sort of device provision, helping access social uh, tariffs and other provision, a huge, huge range. 
Of course, it's a mixed bag as well, though, depending on where you are in London, your ability to access the support you need, whether it's device connectivity, skills or other support, can't be guaranteed. It's very variable, but key lesson I'm sure we'll come back to is we do not want to disrupt. We want to build on the amazing stuff that's already in place. Another piece of work we did was to develop a set of personas about digitally excluded Londoners to really understand and really emphasize the point that digital exclusion is an umbrella term that covers a huge range of different needs that sort of manifest in quite different ways, whether you're the elderly grandmother wanting to you know, use a tablet to Skype or uh, FaceTime your, your grandkids compared to someone living in a temporary accommodation hostel who's trying to claim benefits. The needs are different. The response needs to be different. We created those personas and then backed them up with an open data map of London. So we looked at factors that correlate with being digitally excluded for those different personas. We've overlaid them on a map and now boroughs across London can use that data, add on their own more sensitive data held locally and use it to try and target their interventions to where they're most needed. We've been working on exemplars as well um, to see how do we really go deep on some of those personas and do something useful Two to mention, one is uh, the community of people living with dementia and their carers. A real, if we felt isolated uh, during those COVID lockdowns, people with medical needs and their carers have been really, really adversely affected. That human contact, that support has been so absent. But actually, even without having a lockdown, looking at how we can more digitally enable those groups so that they're always connected, so that they always have forms of support um, as they try and handle uh, quite difficult circumstances. Final thing to say is, you know, observing these 100 plus initiatives that already exist in London, looking at the stuff that Lottie's been able to try and catalyze, uh, thanks to the work of people like Chris, our borough members, our VCS partners and private sector partners, um, is that we can't keep treating digital inclusion like it's a campaign that we get very excited about and energized and talk a lot about when there's been a particular crisis. We need to shift into a sustainable service model whereby we shouldn't ever again be asking who is digitally excluded. We shouldn't be clutching around going, oh, what kind of provision do you happen to have in your postcode area? We need a much more structured, much more sustainable approach. That's why I'm interested at Lottie and look forward to hearing the panel's thoughts on how we achieve just that. Thanks. Thanks so much, Eddie. Um, I've got a thousand thoughts, but this is not my uh, not my panel. I'd love to spend the rest of the day talking about that that wall garden approach you've made and the fact that you've placed users at the heart of um, everything that you be, you've begun with, Lottie and the boroughs. Um, really fascinating stuff. Um, I, if I move on, if I may, to Claudia, um, is it okay if we bring you on this? Because I think it's a good segue into the work you've been doing in Scotland. Um, so I'm a communication Scottish social innovation charity. We do it. People know how to model uh, in which we ask them to deliver a project. So we do that. Claudia. 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 I think your sound might be lagging a little. I think if you would you mind going on mute one second and we'll try and fix that in the background for you. Sorry, it's um, it's coming through a little bit uh, crackly and slow. It sounds like there's a gremlin somewhere between uh, the digital lounge and, and Scotland there. Um, while I get someone to have a look at that for you, if I could come on to Ian, I'll give Emma a chance to settle into the lounge as well. But Ian, um, it, would it be OK to just uh, introduce yourself and talk about the work that you've been doing up in Leeds? Sure, thanks, Chris. Uh, it's good to see fellow panelists. Um, so I work as a digital inclusion coordinator uh, on the 100% Digital Leads program, which is a local authority led initiative. Um, and it's my job to work with and within communities, um, usually where digital exclusion is an obvious issue, along with many other issues as well. Um, and I try to increase digital access digital skills, digital support. Um, so that could be things like helping helping different organizations within communities or different different um, sectors within communities um, with, with things like guidance, training, awareness, 
um, support with funding, joining the dots basically, joining them up to initiatives locally and nationally, joining them up to other organisations that do similar things with similar people or, or sometimes different services and different sectors and trying to get them all thinking about this. Um, and the reason my team and I do all this stuff is because we believe that everyone in Leeds um, should have equal opportunity to use digital tools, technology and services in the way that's right for them and in the, a way that meets their needs. Um, we see digital as a tool for social inclusion. It's an, an enabler. It's an enabler for some of the sort of city priorities we have in Leeds around things like tackling poverty, reducing equality. It's also an enabler for people to achieve and to do the things that they want to do and that are meaningful to them. Um, now, I've been doing this for four years and obviously right slap bang in the middle of it. Things changed quite a lot for obvious reasons and um, everything we'd been saying for the kind of couple of years prior to the pandemic um, became far more pertinent. And I quite liked what Eddie has just said um, about stop treating digital inclusion like it's a campaign, something to get excited about, actually make it sustainable. And that's kind of what we've tried to do in Leeds. We've we've seen a lot of a lot of change over the last two years, um, and we think we think it's been taken a lot more seriously. Um, as well by lots of the organisations we work with on the ground, grassroots organisations, but also at that governmental level, all, all bit you know, national government, but also the local government that I'm, I'm kind of part of. We kind of, we're kind of the link between the two, if you like. Um, now, in the pandemic, a lot of things changed for, for people. We know that. And, and I think we're here today partly to talk about connectivity and devices as well. And that's, that's kind of a theme. Um, and it's it's a strange one because I've had conversations over the last couple of years where people think that giving someone a, a device that's, you know, got data on it or it's internet enabled, whatever, that solves a problem. But it doesn't because, fees, you know, it, it could do for a lot of people, but feasibly that could just get used as a paperwork, that thing. Um, it needs to have that holistic wraparound support it needs to have an infrastructure around it. So while we believe, you know, local intervention, grassroots interventions are key to what we do, we also need that local leadership, that vision, that ownership of the of the issue. And I think that there are deeper issues underlying some of the challenges around this, um, which is why we always think of people, you know, there's no silver bullet because there's no single measure of digital exclusion for a start. And that's because people are all different. They have different lives. They have different needs, challenges, aspirations, motivations, lifestyles, cultures, you name it. Um, we kind of think about, we, well, we work with people who will think about the person first and kind of go backwards from that and think about the outcomes. Um, so we kind of, we're trying to build in Leeds a digital inclusion infrastructure. And a really good example is, it's, it, it's a bit of a revolving door because I know people who I've worked with who, at the you know, two years ago, at the start of 2020, they were digitally included. But over the course of the last two years, they're digitally excluded because they've lost earnings, they've lost a job, they've had to choose between having data or feeding the meter or putting food on the table. And you know, in some instances, they've sold their phones and things like that. Um, now, we need to be we need to be less reactive about that. We need something that's sustainable, so that when we live in really parlous times, if something like that happens to so, someone, we can give a phone to, and they can become digitally included. That's great. What happens to the next person? We need to think. That's why we're trying to create something within a community where we strengthen a place or a community to empower a person at any point of that journey, that pathway, if you like. Um, so I'm looking forward to some discussion today about some of these issues, but I'll hand back to you, Chris. Ian, thank you so much. And I think um, 
you know, it, it brings, or it certainly evokes, you know, links to the last conversation and certainly some of the things Eddie was saying about, this is about people. This is a dynamic issue. This is about circumstances and circumstances out there at the moment are pretty choppy. Um, and so linking all of that sustainability together and think, thinking about, you know, the reflection of the last couple of years, a lot of the initiatives began at grassroots. They filtered and been aligned with local government and combined authorities. And maybe that paralysis or inaction from central government uh, has been craved for, but actually maybe it shouldn't have started there in the first place. Lots and lots of things spinning around my head, but normally when things are spinning around my head, I turn to Dr. Emma Stone. So we're going to stay up in, uh, up in the north of England, we're going to make our way across across the M62 from uh, Leeds to Sheffield, if we may, if that's where you are now, Emma, and um, please, after you. Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. Um, so I'm Emma Stone, I work for Good Things Foundation, and we are a digital inclusion charity that works across the UK um, and also supports some work in other parts of the world as well. Um, and um, and it, is, is, it is really good to have this opportunity just to be able to reflect and focus on digital inclusion as part of the wider Digital Leaders um, Week. Um, and it was brilliant actually following on from the conversations earlier around uh, companies and the role of industry and how industry has stepped up uh, to recognise this as an issue and to provide support, whether that's through donations or data connectivity or devices or just also recognising this as a really important issue for the country. Um, and uh, and one of the things that feels so important about having this conversation now is about how do we make sure we sustain the momentum. So we've talked a lot about sustainability, but part of that is just sustaining that this is still important, even when we're out of lockdown, even when we've moved kind of into um, a more post pandemic era, we will still be living with the effects of that. Um, but it just feels really important to raise awareness. And I think that's why so many of us felt underwhelmed by the UK government's digital strategy, because it just wasn't putting enough emphasis on digital inclusion and how that is so important for the future and looking forward. Um, it's also great that Claudia hopefully will be able to rejoin in because we've, you know, we've seen uh, much stronger uh, kind of visionary leadership at a national government level in Scotland and also in Wales than, than we have seen from the UK government. So it'll be great to have Claudia talking more about that. And similarly, kind of thinking about that leadership at Combined Authority, it's brilliant to have Eddie here from Lottie, uh, brilliant to have Ian, because I think Leeds have definitely been forerunners in this space as well, in terms of joining up and just really recognising that a digital inclusion strategy doesn't sit by itself. It needs to be linked to other strategies and other agendas and at different levels. Um, I think the last thing I want to say is really coming back to that grassroots point, because I think, and this will be a lovely segue on to Claudia as well, because Claudia's organisation, People Know How, uh, is brilliantly one of the organisations that's in our UK network. Uh, it's a network that exists really to support digital inclusion, and we see our role as coordinating that as a free network, is a really open and diverse network, so it might include includes libraries, hostels, some houses, there are a few GP practices in there, so it's a real mix. But the key is, this is a network of organisations and groups that have a base in communities. And this is where the grassroots comes in, because over the last two years, um, you know, we have come to rely so much more and seen the importance of those community and grassroots organisations, because they're the ones that have the reach, have the relationships and have the trust with the people who need this support the most. Um, if we're going to increase the take up of social tariffs, it is unlikely to be uh, taken up without the support of those sorts of organisations and that trusted word of mouth that A, social tariffs exist, and B, social tariffs is something that you might want to consider applying even if there are still some hoops to, to jump through to do that. 
it's that sort of thing. It's where the access to data and devices and digital skills can all come together. Because as I said, we know all of those are important. Not everyone needs them all, but we know we've got 10 million people in this country who lack even the basics. We know Ian's completely right that people can move in and out, not there being a, them being able to afford uh, a device and afford uh, data. Their skills and their levels of comfort confidence as the online world continues to change as the services they're needing to access continue to change being able to have somewhere to go when things go wrong when you need support you know to be able to work out how digital can um benefit you uh you know if that's the choice that you're making then you, you know that's where the community organizations uh, are so important and they do amazing work and we need all of us, we need to make sure they have the resources and the funding and the support to be able to do and I think that is where the kind of the elephant in the room of the sustainability comes because to a certain extent, we, we kind of know what works. What we don't know is how to sustain it and pay for it and make sure everyone has got the access it and build the confidence of the others uh, in local places, in organisations, um, in companies who can play their role too. That's the bit that we're still trying to figure out. Emma, thank you so much. Um, I think what you said will hopefully strike a chord and please anyone in the in the audience, please do put a QA and a in there about we do kind of know what works. Um, as Ian mentioned, as Eddie mentioned as well previously, we know there's no single silver bullet and we know that the, the this element of inequality is made up of a number of elements and is and, and changes over time but the grassroots do know how to help and support people um there are parallels in terms of food and fuel poverty that we can maybe draw in the future that i know are part of other discussions but um it can be frustrating knowing people's lives can be made better and it's a lack of resources and a lack of will in other areas that may be behind this. Um, I'm going to try again, Claudia, to bring you in. I think we fixed you. Let's try. Is this oh, any better? Um, better, yes. Well, does to the okay. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, there is a bit of traffic, so apologies for that. Um, but hopefully, I don't sound like a robot anymore. Um, yeah. So. Uh, don't know how much you heard but i'm communications and digital manager at people know how uh, we're a scottish social innovation charity um, and everything that we do is based on our social innovation model so that starts with asking the community what they need researching uh, delivering projects and then sharing the learning and collaborating um, so we have two core services um, as well as a variety of other things but uh, our two core services are the positive transition service which supports young people in the transition from primary to high school which for a digital conference seems slightly not on topic. However, with the pandemic, almost everything started to, to bring in aspects of digital. Um, we also have Reconnect, which supports adults and families to improve well-being by increasing digital and social inclusion. And we deliver these uh, projects through one-to-one -one and group support. So over the pandemic, we adapted online. We went through a big digital transformation. So all aspects of the charity went online or went through distance support. Um, in the cases that people weren't confident enough to get online. Um, so as I was thinking about what I was going to say when I got to this point, I thought people might be asking themselves, how did we come to be at a panel around grassroots and government? Um, but when the pandemic hit, um, we kind of drew on our over six years of support around digital. Um, so we've always held this idea that digital and social inclusion are inextricably linked. Um, and when COVID hit, um, we really took that to the next level. Uh, we supported over 4,000 people with digital um, through delivering refurbished devices to the community, supporting people with digital skills and supporting people with connectivity. Um, and we really um, kind of turbocharged this work through our Connect4 social innovation platform, which is a platform that promotes cross-sectoral collaboration across the third academic, business and public sectors. Um, and one of the ways in which we do this is through events. Um, so we hold events in which people can come together and talk about things that maybe they might be experiencing similar issues, but being in different sectors, they might not have had the opportunity to, to uh, collaborate, to talk together and share ideas. 
Um, and this starts to kind of delve into the second tier of our social innovation model, which talks about action research, campaigning and lobbying. So in the middle of COVID, uh, we held our event Connect for Digital Inclusion because we had been doing a lot around digital. We've been noticing that a lot of our projects that weren't traditionally involved with digital became digital. We were doing online activities with young people, trying to develop ways to engage with young people that were not able to go to school in their homes um, in a strange sort of environment um, for support, for example, in their bedrooms with their sisters and brothers hanging around, things like that. Um, so we wanted to hear from other organizations as well um, and see what their experiences were like so we held this event um, and as well as key speakers, we had some um, breakout rooms and the discussions really highlighted that data poverty um, is the largest obstacle to digital inclusion. And when we talk about uh, digital, we talk about the devices, the skills, the connectivity, um, and we can provide devices, we can provide support for skills, but all of the solutions for connectivity currently um, available in Scotland are temporary. Um, so this in combination with our work with Connecting Scotland, the Scottish government scheme um, that uh, aims to get people connected over the pandemic. Um, so we run the helpline for this and we distribute devices. Um, so we have experience in supporting people with the connectivity that they provide, which initially was um, it was limited. It was 20 gigabytes per month. So we had a lot of calls around, oh, I've just uh, I've just used up all my data. So nothing's working. Oh, have you just discovered BBC iPlayer? Yes, I have. OK, so unfortunately, you have to wait until next month, but we can provide you with options to, to kind of start understanding data usage and things like that. Um, so from all of this, uh, we developed our Connectivity Now uh, Scotland wide campaign to end data poverty. Um, and it has three uh, core call to actions. The first is to regulate connectivity, to start seeing connectivity as a basic utility alongside uh, water, electricity, gas, um, and to really tackle the, the poverty premium as well. Uh, the second is to share data um, in shared housing, um, in community spaces, in a secure and private way. Um, and the third is to zero rate essential service websites. So this is the idea, something similar to um, a free phone, the 0800 number. So you shouldn't, uh, we believe that you shouldn't have to be spending part of your data allowance in order to access essential service websites like council tax, for example. Um, so we're currently running that. We encourage pledges um, from across the four sectors. Um, and as, we'll, as we're promoting that, we're also continuing collaboration. We continue our on the ground work, which is a really big part of what we do. And it really informs our work on a national scale um, with kind of real life case studies and stories that we're constantly hearing and, and sharing. Um, and we're working connectivity solutions into our projects as well. Um, and we're also working on a lot of research, collaboration, as Emma mentioned, uh, we're working together quite a lot. Um, and we're working on a couple of guides together as well. Um, Thing in the back of our minds is always that kind of lasting long-term solution to connectivity and to data poverty. Claudia, thank you so much. You'll definitely find a fan in me on the zero rating piece as well, but it's great to hear those reflections on, and Emma will tell me off for even mentioning those words. Um, thank you so much, everyone. It's the, one of the pleasures of this is is I think that, you know, the gold standard has been set by the combined authorities and connecting Scotland. Um, Emma and I work on a number of national initiatives like the Data Poverty Lab and the National Data Bank came through that. And Eddie, you're in um, an incredible position with Lottie in, as you embark on that, that work in London. I wanted to ask a quick question before we start just moving into those government circle questions to say, or to ask, do we know enough? Um, one of the biggest challenges we had certainly during the pandemic was the disruption to what we thought we knew about digital exclusion, um, digital poverty as a whole. Um, and that the figures that we thought we were measuring weren't necessarily asking the right questions. And that if I wanted to go and look for intelligence now and insights now, I can get it at a conceptual level, but can I get real time, solid data about the situation that people across the UK are facing and really understand and act on that? So I suppose it's an open question of, do we are we backed by the right intelligence and information that we need to make activities work? Eddie, looks like your mic is off, so I'll go for you. So we'll just say a quick word. It's 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 one of the reasons we did that uh, sub mapping of those digitally exclude digitally excluded personas because uh, one of the things we've founded uh, found is that organisations come to London and saying we'd love to help, but you know what what 
where's the need? How many devices do you need? How many free data packages do you need? And the honest answer was, we don't know. And a lot of the sort of national research uh, is helpful for quantifying it, but unless we can then target that to where the interventions are needed, incredibly difficult. So we've started on that road. We're trying to get more granular data. There's a long way to go, but I want to make sure we're never again clutching around with the question, who is digitally excluded? But fascinated to hear if other panellists have cracked this in another way. Ian, it'd be great to come to you and talk about how that might have uh, managed gonna... in the Leeds area. I was going to say, uh, short answer, I didn't know. <laughs> um, it's what do we what do we measure with this? You know, can you measure? You can't, for instance, measure households with internet access because that doesn't mean anything really. Um, whether people have essential digital skills, well, is that applicable to everyone? Actually, do they? Is that what they need? So, um, my manager raised the point the other day, which is, you know, are they relevant to say people in? care homes who are approaching the end of life, you know, where actually they need it for to stay in touch with friends, family, things like that. We just tend to use indicators. Um, and the same as we, we look at other strategies around the city on in different things. So that could be employment strategies. It could be tackling poverty, health, things like that, health inequalities. Um, we know that, for instance, in Leeds, we've got 57 odd thousand households in fuel poverty and we know that 61,000 accessed a food bank in the last year. They're pretty good indicators that people might also be struggling with, with, uh, with, with you know, digital poverty as well. And we kind of, tr we try to go through, through that route, looking at these indicators, um, you know, we, we see the national stats as well that come out and we we can sort of like look at the local stuff we've got and try and make those connections but it's um we know who's more likely basically to be digitally yeah. excluded but we don't know who is definitely digitally excluded it's a tough nut to crack yeah no i think that's a really honest and interesting answer because it, it does point to a lot of the challenges we've had emma over to you yeah um so if lee smith is still in I want to just put a big shout out to Lee because Lee was really instrumental in um, in the work getting the UK Consumer Digital Index up and running and just alongside Ofcom data without that we would know much much less uh, but even there as we we're saying that's kind of national level stats and it gives us a really important picture and important um, view but thinking back to what Ian was saying, we know that people will move in and out. That point about it being a spectrum, the point about it being, uh, you know, um, not uh, static, you know, you're not, you're not digitally included then forever and then nothing changes. And I think that's really important to grow mean that there are reasons why we will look at the data and see we seem to be still stuck here. What should we expect that data to be doing? Uh, in a year's time or in two years time and that's where it becomes frustrating in terms of actually being able to measure progress um, we also really could do with data that enables us to speak more into other sectors of policy and strategy so that does the join up in terms of looking at uh, you know bringing digital access inclusion together with say accessing health services or uh, accessing uh, other forms of support um, I, th I think that's the other part of the picture because that's that those are the other people who are going yeah well what's you know what is going on here we can talk at a conceptual level around digital widening uh, health inequalities where people are excluded but um, that's all correlations we don't have the data to be able to point to you know cause and point to change without a doubt we all know enough risk factors to be able to get action going and so I'm, I'm passionate about research i'm passionate about evidence but i'm also passionate that we don't have enough data shouldn't stop us taking action because we completely know which are the sorts of households which are the sorts of communities and places which most need intervention yeah thank you i think i mean we can certainly draw attention i think the digital exclusion heat map is it from Greater Manchester, which I think contains some information that can be translated into other people's so, regions for people here? 
Yeah, it's shorthanded to the DERI, the Digital Exclusion Risk Index. Yeah. So if that's a, a useful tool, I know some people were asking about resources. Um, potentially a, a, an issue that may affect Claudia less in Scotland, because I think the, the government have been fairly well receptive, but is one of the challenges of, of we have indicators, as you've said, that means we can act. And there's, we know there's an incredible amount of passion in the digital exclusion, digital inclusion community um, from all the work that's done. But does that paucity of, of data mean that we struggle to then make the business case? Because digital, bringing the government in now, digital was quoted at me a little while ago as the orphan issue, digital exclusion. Um, didn't really feel like it sat anywhere, officially DCMS, but it has strong parallels to other departments. Does it still feel like the orphan issue um, for you? Um, and does it feel like something fundamental needs to change? Or are we kind of okay having had our incredible moment in the sun, I suppose, during the pandemic to draw attention to, to this issue? I don't know, Ian, if you've got any, any thoughts on that or any of the other panel members. Um, yeah, it does. It does straddle many different departments, and I think, I think, it's it's difficult because it's all sort of siloed, isn't it? And that's that's ultimately the issue, and it means different things to to different government departments. It also means different things to different organisations. I will speak to in Leeds, um, and it's getting them to see that link up and where it's all how it's all joined. Um, and again it's 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 difficult but we have made some progress on a on a local level i don't really know about that how, how that translates nationally though like yeah. we, you will get this kind of reactive thing where one department will say right well, we need to crack this because it will solve this ish issue without speaking to other departments where actually by combining resources and combining yeah. expertise it will solve both issues or three issues or four issues um so yeah i, I think um it's that ownership that's that's lacking that's lacking and eddie different different I'll, I'll come to you claudia in a second but eddie before we lose you in in two minutes a final word on um from you on on in terms of the london boroughs and that um and the enthusiasm and support that that you you might receive a, a regional from a regional perspective but I think to, to, to the government point, and I say this having been a sort of policy advisor in the past, in part, I'm not waiting on national government to step up and do anything. I think it's, you know, it's focus on the stuff that's within our sphere of influence. And I think candidly, as local government, as a collection of VCS and private sector organisations, I suspect central government will step up more when we go to them with an absolutely rock solid ask, which in part, and taking ownership on ourselves in London, is to get our own house really, really in order. And what I haven't seen is any lack of enthusiasm. I think, you know, the pandemic, if there's any silver lining, yes, it's now got that political attention nationally and locally. It's released some funding. I've been in a very privileged position in London that, again, thanks to the GLA that channeled £1.3 million into borough and VCS activities to try and coordinate this. And I think that sense talking right across VCS private sector and boroughs is that we can't go this alone. We have to get that right balance between supporting all those grassroots initiatives, but trying to figure out how are we more than the sum of our parts? How do we make sure that people don't slip through the net because it is so many players, because there are so many players there? And on Thursday this week, very pleased we're working with the Good Things Foundation uh, to have a conference bringing representatives from all those three different sectors into the same room to pose that question, how do we collaborate more effectively and how do we shift it from all these amazing local initiatives but ensure that yeah, people don't slip through the gap, that we are financially sustainable. And if necessary, let us speak with one voice to central government and maybe then they'll step up and listen. Fantastic point. Eddie, we'll let you go. We know we need to let you fly the nest now, um, but please do. Thank you so anyone... much. Thanks, Eddie. For anyone who is interested and doesn't need to travel by train on Wednesday, no, Thursday, then, um, then the Lottie conference with Good Things looks really, really interesting. Claudia, can I come to you? We, we look north of the border, or I certainly do, with, um, with a bit of jealousy, I suppose, particularly during the pandemic, seeing Connecting Scotland um, successfully be a, 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 
um, a really affected marriage between civil society and 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 government. Um, have you seen a lot less friction there? And has that has that um, involvement sustained since the pandemic's um, kind of finished in inverted commas? Said said with COVID today. Yeah. So um, the Connecting Scotland scheme was was really great. Well, is really great. Um, uh, just the way that it kind of tied in lots of different organizations and um, because we run the helpline we get calls from from all over scotland saying oh i was given this device by this person by that so we're really hearing experiences from from all across the country um and yeah i mean i think um the as the operators of the helpline some of the biggest queries we we still get are around the, the connectivity the network the the mi-fi devices which the scheme provides um and it's been it's just, I mean, for us, I think it was one of the key, the key elements that that influenced our campaign, um, because it is, it's really great that it's been done um, and it has been um, joined up, but it, we still need to do more. Um, so I was, uh, I was talking with someone yesterday with our chief exec, and we were talking about so Connecting Scotland has handed out sixty thousand devices, um, which is what the goal was. But if we're saying we always use the stat one in five people face digital exclusion with 5 million people in Scotland, we would need 1 million devices. So there's still a ways to go. Um, and also with the with the um, the connectivity, it's two years currently. Um, and we don't really know when that, like what happens after that two years. They did actually renew it once, but it, it's kind of, that's why the, the campaign is there because we're really lobbying the government to a case of that Yeah. Yeah. Claudia, um, thank you. I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. That This is race by. I, would, I could speak to Emma, Claudia and Ian um, all day on this subject. I think there's so much more ground to cover. I'm really sorry to cut everybody off at that point as well. Um, thank you so much. Hopefully there's been some information shared in the in the discussion there for, for links, but um, and hopefully that Polly and, and Robin and the team can share our details for, for more discussion and indeed collaboration. So thank you so much everybody i hope you have, have a great rest of the afternoon um at the conference and we'll see you soon thank you very very much chris um eddie who's who's gone but maybe if he's watching this back um emma um claudia and ian yeah that that was a really really rich and interesting discussion and, and as chris said lots of links and interesting things being put in the chat now um, we've got about 40 minutes um, for lunch and networking and the lounge will stay open. So as before, um, feel free to turn on your camera and microphone whilst you're in the Digi Lounge and you can move around the tables by double clicking on other tables and you can move floors by clicking on the floor buttons, which when we're back in the room, I think are on the left. Um, and then when we return, we'll pick up on today's third thread, which is all around support, capability and motivation. So I'll see you back here at 1.45. Thanks.